Um, so how are we going to help kids make and keep friends? Um, and so let's sort of look, uh, let's start with defining what is a friend. So I'd love it if you'd put in the chat some of your thoughts, you know, what is a friend? What does a friend mean to you? Um, I think a friend is someone who you know and uh, with whom you share a mutual bond of non-sexual attraction and affection. Uh, friends come in all shapes and sizes. There are best buddies, there are true friends, there are acquaintances, and sometimes there are fake friends. Um, best buddies are your nearest and dearest pals. Everybody needs one or two of these people in their lives. They're folks you trust completely, have known a while, and who have your back. Um, they're also your inner circle. Uh, true friends are trustworthy, uh, but you may not hang out with them as much. Uh, you like each other and you do stuff together and they're easy to be around. Acquaintances are people with whom you are familiar. Maybe you share some classes or, you know, you say hello at, 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 um, at work. Um, maybe you can sit next to uh, a, an acquaintance at a meeting or if you're a student at an assembly or lunch, but you don't spend a lot of time with them outside the environment where you're kind of thrown together. Um, uh, maybe they would be kids on uh, who are on a soccer team that your child plays on, or maybe there are uh, people who you know go to your church or your synagogue or your mosque. And finally, fake friends are kind of you know people who pretend to like you but might make fun of you behind your back or put you down or trash talk you behind your back. Um, they might uh, talk to uh, a child or a teen or an adult when no one else is around. They might be popular kids who seem important and have status but really can't be trusted with any personal information. And then of course there are strangers. And these are people who are potential friends. We don't know them yet and we haven't gotten to meet them. So I would like to say hi to Anthony and Georgia and hi Sebastian. Um, Sebastian, you're saying uh, falling asleep during classes or presentations, easily forget to contact friends or relatives, out of sight, out of mind. Mm, that's interesting. I wonder if any of you, uh, others of you have an out of sight, out of mind kind of experience with people in your lives. So I haven't seen too many responses yet. Um, what is the definition of a friend for you? Um, what does a friend mean and where might you get stuck or where does your child get stuck in friendships? Because theoretically this is a, 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 um, a talk about um, for parents, but we seem to have a lot of adults here and it's great to have you. So, um, you know, let's try to answer some of those questions so we can start a conversation. Hi Lynn, nice to see you. Um, thank you for joining. So, um, Lynn, Anthony says, a friend is someone who listens to you in a time of need. Okay, what else is a definition of a friend? Um, someone who is honest, Lynn says, thank you. Anybody else? What else is a definition of a friend? Um, because we wanna be a friend to get a friend, right? And so we have to know what friendship means to us and we have to help our kids understand what friendship means to them so that they can be the friend they would like to receive. So friendship, as we know, is earned through time, shared experiences, similar interests, and personal disclosure. Many kids desire friends, but often don't understand how to engage peers in conversation or activities without dominating them. Kids especially, um, those who are neurodivergent, need to learn the ins and outs of these social skills. So we're gonna have to teach them some of these conversational skills. How to listen uh, when someone is speaking and repeat back what you hear. Where to look and how to hold your body in space. In our culture, it's about an arm's distance. The appropriate volume of your voice and how touchy you can be, you know, with someone, you know, when you keep your body parts to yourself and when is it okay to touch them on the shoulder or something. Um, 
and um, how to initiate conversations. And how to initiate conversations is something that we can really practice at the dinner table with our families um, and give gentle feedback and redirection as well. Um, we also, you know, as parents, we want to try to help younger kids in particular facilitate friendships by working with their teachers to pair them with appropriate mates for projects to help build connections. So let's see what we're having. We're getting some conversation here, which is great. Um, so what is a friend? A friend is someone who is honest, who gets you. A friend is who you who helps you in, in a situation and you smile together, help each other through good times and bad. Um, times are with you, love you for who you really are. Um, someone who doesn't criticize me or makes me feel stupid when I say or do something without thinking seems to be on the same wavelength. I'm very uncomfortable and quiet while in groups of people. Okay, so you know what I'm hearing, um, it seems like most of the people who are attending here are here for yourselves, which is great, not necessarily for your kids, which is you know fine. Um, so we really want to think about how do we you know make friends and how do we, you know, uh, as, as an adult, but also how do we help children make friends and keep friends? So one of the things, of course, if we're talking about challenges with friendship is we're talking about social anxiety. And social anxiety is a condition of worrying about humiliation and rejection in ways that restrict your activities or interests for six months or more. It can complicate the ability of a child or a teen or adult to connect with peers. Believing that people are looking at you and making fun of you when they really aren't, or being extremely self-conscious about yourself when speaking to others can also indicate social anxiety. Extreme shyness, being unable to eat in front of others or experience panic attacks in social situations, or public environments um, can also be warning signs of social anxiety. You know, if you think that you might suffer from social anxiety or your, your youngster might suffer from social anxiety, it's really important to speak to your primary care provider um, um, to get some assistance and maybe to try to find a therapist who could help you work through some of this. Um, Susan says, is it hard for quiet, quote, quiet kids or wallflowers to make friends? So, you know, I, I'm not a big fan. Of, I mean, I know there was a book called The Perks of Being a Wallflower and everything, but, you know, wallflowers, it, 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 you know, can kind of be a derogatory term. And I think it's hard for kids who um, are, you know, quieter and do better with one-on-one -on -one interactions or feel uncomfortable sharing parts of themselves to reach out in a, you know, gregarious kind of world, uh, particularly in a neurotypical gregarious kind of world. And so um, they, th these are kids uh, and sometimes adults for whom, you know, smaller one-on-one on one interactions or a few kids are much easier for them to make connections. Um, you know, there are many people who don't like to go out in groups or participate in, you know, um, uh, situa social situations with more than one or two people. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a, that's a personal preference. But I think the issue that we want to think about is, you know, is there a loneliness that's associated with that? Is there a feeling of, um, uh, insecurity and uh, and kind of a negative self-judgment as well. Uh, Sebastian says, a friend is someone that you feel safe around and be your true self with. As a child, I always had the ease of being friends with everyone, but never really had close friends. In adulthood, I made several social circles. Well, that's really interesting, Sebastian. I'm wondering how you Tr you sort of transitioned from one thing to another. As a child, you were in this way, and then as an adult, you have other social circles. What is it that you did or you learned to do as an adult? Because I think that would be helpful for other people who might struggle, but it would also be helpful for you know parents out there to think about how they could support their kids in 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 being able to you know sort of you know, step a little bit outside of their comfort zone, one step at a time. 
So another thing that we want to think about when making friends is to determine, you know, particularly with kids, you know, what the right amount of involvement is for a parent in the social lives of our, ch our children. You know, as parents, we are acutely sensitive and reactive to any social challenges our kids may be experiencing. And when there's an issue, instead of giving advice, uh, what we often, when there's an issue, we often um, give advice instead of listening. So we want to try to listen instead of giving advice. And it can be kind of anxiety provoking as a parent um, or as a partner or a cousin or a friend to, you know, basically listen and not necessarily tell people what to do, but let them kind of unfold and figure it out for themselves. So what we, what we want to try to do is to put our own reactions and agendas aside in order to truly listen. And we all struggle with this. I mean, I'm a parent, I struggle with this myself, of course, um, because we may want to offer ideas that help solve other people's problems um, without asking them first if they're actually interested in what we might want to say or suggest. Um, so many, many kids in particular want to talk about what's happening in their lives, but they want to, you, they want to, they prefer to sort of explore their own solutions rather than um, have you kind of let them know um, what you think they should do. So that means in conversations with people, we want to ask questions such as what, how, when, and where which open up a conversation rather than asking why, which tends to close things down. So if your child or your teen perhaps is engaging in unsafe or behavior or inappropriate behaviors, then you'll likely need to step in in a more directive way, of course. And you want to talk with them about what this might be. So um, Sandy says, I couldn't run away fast enough when it came, comes to social gatherings. So what is it about social gatherings that was hard, that's hard for some of you? I, I would really like to hear about that. And while you're putting your answers up in the chat, I am going to look for a different downloadable as a gift because the gift that I have is I have two I have one for parent I have one for parents. But it seems like we have a lot of adults here and we might want to talk a little bit about how um, sort of making and, and keeping friends for adults. So let's see what I can find here for you all that might be helpful. Um, let's see. Here we go. I think, uh, I think I've shared this before, but I think you'll find this useful. Here it is. Here we go. And here is something for uh, for parents also. So this is managing, um, this is about managing social anxiety for um, neurodivergent uh, children and teens. So this should be helpful too. Um, you're welcome, you're welcome Kate Kate, thanks. So Sebastian says, I think that it's because I had so many different interests. My parents were open to the idea of me joining all kinds of activities and were also open to invite the new friends over into our home. Thank you so much for saying this Sebastian. I think that's so important because one of the things that helps kids figure out you know who their who their people are is to you know is to experiment and explore you know try hanging out with this person maybe try hanging out with this other person and then being able to um, sort of nurture their interests because friendships really are about the things that you've talked about but they're also about having commonalities having shared experiences and um, and and passions um, and I think. You know, the other thing that you said, Sebastian, which is great, is that your parents invited your friends over to their house. And sometimes, particularly for kids who are, you know, what we would consider to be quiet or shy, it's helpful maybe to have the family, like have a pizza night and have invite um, the parents and family of a child that your, your child is starting to get to know or meet at the playground or, you know, go, um, go for some ice cream together or something where the where it's less pressure on the one-on-one -on -one connection and and the families are together kind of neutralizing it. Anthony says it's down hard for my 10-year-old. His behavior has given him a reputation so people think 
he thinks are friends make fun of him mm, and egg him on behind his back. It's very tough to find friends for kids with ADHD. You know, Anthony, this really can be true. And we talked about this, about these fake friends who sort of will like, you know, sort of act like you're okay in front of them, but then behind you really kind of put you down. Um, and this sort of leads us into talking a little bit about uh, bullying, which I'm gonna get to in a minute. So Lynn says, I feel like everyone is staring at me and sizing my outfits or my weight. So this is definitely, a, that's definitely a reflection of social anxiety because in social anxiety, we think we know what other people are thinking about us. And the problem is we don't really know that. And it's sort of a figment of our imagination. And so we can't really be present in what's happening in the moment because we're so busy thinking about what other people are thinking about us. And so it's very important that when you're in a situation to actually actively say I'm not going in I'm not going down that lane I'm going to be with where I am right now present in what people are saying and doing and not focusing on what they may or may not be thinking about me which definitely could be incorrect Susan I didn't like the rock music that my generation loves even to this day it's too loud that would that would be a challenge um, you gotta find people who like what you like um, Georgia, sometimes even if they have a correct approach, um, the society reminds them, gives them a bad message. Right. So even if, um, even if people with ADHD kids or adults are, are really making an effort to connect and do the quote unquote, you know, um, socially, uh, you know, more, um, relevant kind of uh, behavior, um, society could be giving them a message that they're off and they're messing up. Uh, most parents something their successes on their children. So I think you're right, Georgia, that most parents um, sort of rate their own success as a parent based on how their children are doing. And, and that's something that's started early early on and it's it's something that is is not super helpful as a parent and it's not helpful for a kid but a lot of a lot of us do it uh, there's a lot of pressure on parents to really succeed um, as much as possible and um, and to and to to uh, succeed means all kinds of things in different societies but it can do with money and social status and um, academic success, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, once ADHD, once they have ADHD, sometimes they can have a bad experience, yes, and it can discourage people to come in. That's true. So I'm curious, um, you know, one of the things that we, of course, want to talk about when we're thinking about those, you know, sticky situations for um, kids with ADHD and for adults is social media. Um, so, uh, you know, social media is something that is, you know, <laughs> everywhere. It's pervasive. It's 24-7. Um, you can't, you know, you can turn it off, but you can get on it anytime you want and check in and see how things are. So one of the things when we think about social media with, um, with kids is how to teach digital citizenship. What does it mean to interact on social media with integrity? Um, and I'm curious for you, uh, those of you who are participating, what does it mean for you to interact on social media with integrity? And what kind of behaviors on social media are you accepting, excuse me, expecting, um, and accepting, maybe it's expecting and accepting from, um, your, from your children, but also from uh, your community? Um, we want to rec we recognize now, as opposed to you know even three or four years ago, that um, the world of uh, what the online world is a very real world. Um, that um, for our kids, it's not there's no separation between what's happening online and what's happening, yeah, you know, on a day to day basis, and that's very different from how most of us grew up today, who are parents. Um, and those of us who are slightly older adults as well. 
one thing that I think is important when we think about social media is modeling how to interact with our social media and how for our kids, um, but also really giving some thought for ourselves. What is it and how is it that we want to um, really show up both um, online and in person? Um, some families really benefit from times where there's just no technology at the dinner table on a Saturday or a Sunday, a special outing or something like that. Um, and we want to remember that a technology really access to, access to technology in terms of social media for kids is, um, is, is really about um, being able to um, earn it as a privilege. It's not, it's, not, it's not an entitlement. And a lot of kids think that they should have uh, social media because everyone else does, or they should have you know, Snapchat or whatever it is. And you as parents can decide you know, when that's going to happen. I mean, I've worked with parents who basically say, mm, you can't get Snapchat till you're in eighth grade. And that's, that's how it works. And you can text, but you're not going to get Snap. So that's something that you have to decide as a family. Kapil says, uh, just the same as we accept, uh, expect and accept in person. I, I agree. You know, I think that what happens with um, online interactions is that people say and do things online that they would never say or do to someone else's face. I call this the what would grandma say rule because, um, you know, if you wouldn't say it to your grandmother, uh, why would you say it to someone online? Um, we really want to help our kids and ourselves manage that and to kind of cut back on talking about other people behind their backs and really teach how to navigate um, bumps in relationships as well as um, connections. Let's take a few minutes now and um, just say and just talk a little bit about how do you balance your social media with your in-person interactions. Uh, I'm really curious about what works for you and if one is easier than the other. You know, is it easier for you to talk to people with your phone or is it easier for you to, um, or do you find, is it easier and rewarding for you to talk to people on your phone or is it slightly easier but a little less rewarding to do it online or equally rewarding? I'm curious for you, what do you notice for yourself but also for your kids? Lynn says, if you can't say something nice, don't say it at all. Um, Sebastian, Sebastian says, I used to have uh, more of a social media police type of attitude. I think that's that it's now important not to read comments. With my children and niece, I get worried when she plays an online game for kids, I find it unhealthy. With my young niece, excuse me. Um, so a lot of kids connect by gaming. Um, then they connect not just with people in their daily sphere, but people around. Um, and it's important, I think, for it's very important for parents to have a sense of you know, who that world is and even get in there and learn how to play those games. Kids love to teach their parents and beat them, of course. Um, but I think that, you know, we don't want to, I don't think that, you know, reading, uh, you, reading your child's text messages is, is a good way to kind of get a sense of what they're doing in their lives. It's better to be their friend, to establish a trusting, uh, trusting relationship and conversations about what they're doing online, um, um, and, and to have a circle of, of other parents who are involved in your child's life, you know, you, the parents of the kids your child hang out, hangs out with, so you can kind of work together um, and be the village. Uh, Susan says, lucky so much social media didn't exist when my kids were young. How to ADHD is a good social media resource, Facebook and Attitude Magazine too. Yes, I just actually on Monday did a live YouTube with Jessica McCabe, which was a huge honor for me. Um, she is the founder and uh, director and producer, etc., of How to ADHD, and she's an amazing woman, and it's an incredible resource. And Attitude, of course, we do love our Attitude. So let's talk a little bit about bullying because if we're talking about anticipating and extinguishing social hotspots for kids with ADHD, 
Um, we, we, we do want to sort of touch on bullying. I don't know if any of you were bullied as a kid. I was. Um, I think I've shared some of that here. Um, but if you would like to, um, to share your story um, and what you sort of learned from it, you know, sometimes we can have these experiences that are, you know, very traumatizing and we can grow from them. And sometimes we have these traumatizing experiences and we grow and we also replay that trauma over and over. And it's just very complicated. So, of course, when it comes to bullying, um, there are really two responsible parties. The person we call the bully or the aggressor and the bystander. And, of course, then there's the victim. So there are three parties, but there are two responsible parties, the aggressor and the bystander. So most bullying actually happens under the radar of adults, either at school or in the neighborhood or online. And bullying and aggression, of course, can happen in the workplace as well. And that can also happen under the radar or, um, uh, you know, or in, in particularly in terms of exclusion, etc. So, um, you know, oftentimes kids don't want to report bullying because of the enormous stigma attached to being a tattle, you know, someone who tells a responsible adult about something in order to get someone in trouble. And there's a difference between teasing and bullying. Teasing has a good-natured kind of quality about it. Uh, there's joking that's involved that the person who is on the quote-unquote receiving end is laughing about too, that uh, it's, it's, there's a lightness, there's a playfulness. Uh, bullying is really a aggressive kind of taunting that is meant to hurt someone. It's meant to cause harm. And so um, it's different than kind of light teasing. Now teasing can can tr can sort of cross over into that um, that uh, that territory of taunting, um, but it is different. Um, so uh, one thing um, that we want to talk about is a little bit about cyberbullying. So cyberbullying is a serious risk linked to psychological problems in adolescence. Uh, kids and teens who've been cyberbullied have reported higher levels of depression and thoughts of suicide, as well as greater levels of emotional distress, um, hostility, and delinquency compared with peers who are not. Students most often report physical appearance uh, issues, of, excuse me, taunting and around issues of physical appearance, race and ethnicity, gender, disability, religion, and sexual orientation. Um, bystanders or onlookers are people who witness this kind of aggression, bullying, taunting, whatever you want to call it. They witness this behavior and they allow the aggressor to continue by either encouraging it openly or by saying nothing. So the unspoken and often unconscious support of the non-aggressive majority, the bystanders, actually empower the bully. So therefore, the bystander has a great deal of power and responsibility to intervene and stop the harassment, but often they do not. So there's some interesting quote co comments here, so I want to hear. Georgia, I use social media sometimes to be in contact with my daughter, particularly around tough, particular topics. Yep, I understand that. It can be easier sometimes to talk about things, particularly for people with ADHD who may have multiple ideas at the same time or who struggle to get things out, um, to get their ideas out in, in, a, in, in a progression that they feel good about. Uh, to open the conversation, I try to give an assist to let her start to write the speech with me. Um, Lynn, I'm a twin to a sister who does not have ADHD, and she was in the popular group of kids, and I was just forced along, but I was just floating along in the group. 
I have a hard time figuring out those kinds of teasing. You, thank you, Lynn, for bringing that up. I think a lot of uh, kids and adults have a hard time differentiating between teasing and taunting. And you know, you you want to sort of fit in. You don't want to be someone who's tearing up, who's uh, overly sensitive, and yet, you know, being the target of things that people are saying that are unkind is very uncomfortable. And you know, it's you know one of the things that we want to work with our kids and teach them is like where is that boundary? Where is the line um, when it's enough and you need to excuse yourself and go to the bathroom or something? Um, Georgia says, M unfortunately right now you are bullying also if you are a right person. Lynn, never can tell if they're serious or joking. You know, that's actually a really interesting point, Lynn, like you, when you can't really understand if someone is joking with you or if someone is um, actually targeting you. And, um, and I think that's a great thing to really think about and talk about with some of the friends that you have or some trusted um, relatives um, and, and maybe to, to kind of do some practicing around that. Or to be able to come up with a statement that you can say like, I think you're joking, but I'm not completely sure. You know, something that, you know, where you can kind of be light around it, but get some clarity. Um, there are different types, of course, of uh, bullying and aggression. There's direct, hostile, verbal taunting. There's physical intimidation. And there's uh, exclusion as well. I think, you know, when we think about how do we want to uh, assist our, our kids and ourselves in these social hotspots, you know, Martin Luther King has the most incredible quote that he said, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So one of the things that can help us in situations where we are uncomfortable or help our kids in situations where they are uncomfortable is, is, is actually um, being, being friended by uh, someone who will have your back and being a friend to someone who might be targeted and having their back. And so those are conversations that I think are really worth having with our kids. You know, when you see something that you think isn't okay, what do you do about that? How do you voice your opinion? How do you stand up for it? And I think that this is a conversation that we all need to be having, both with our kids and with ourselves right now, in this climate uh, that we live in today where um, basically people say and do a lot of things online that can be you know both insensitive and hurtful so we're going to wrap up in a few minutes um, but I'd love to uh, to hear from you if you have any uh, more uh, comments about you know what is a social hotspot for you or what is a social hotspot for your child? And what have you done that seems to work? And what have you done hmm, that maybe hasn't worked so well? Um, let's see. Um, Georgia says, most of the time, who's bullied someone else has a problem too. That's correct. I believe that's true, Georgia, or in deep insecurity. And Sebastian says, I still have a difficult time with people who are sarcastic. I am very often too trusting, not thinking someone would lie to me on purpose. I understand that, Sebastian. You know, I'm not really a fan of sarcasm at all. I actually think sarcasm is really um, an aggression, um, um, an attempt to sort of cover uh, an aggressive statement with something that's like sarcastic. It's supposed to be funny or clever or whatever. Um, and so uh, I think if you're feeling like someone's being sarcastic, that that is actually a signal that something is off. And, um, and you're probably correct in interpreting that. Um, I don't really, um, when people are sarcastic with me, I'm actually pretty upfront about it. I'm like, I don't understand that. Can you explain? And they're like, oh, I was being sarcastic. And I'm like, mm, I don't really believe in sarcasm. And that kind of, you know, changes the conversation a bit. Um, or that didn't sound sar like, I don't know what sarcasm is, but that sounded kind of hurtful. Something that is calling it what it is. Lynn, workplace, holiday parties with husband for his work, high social anxiety. So that's a real hot spot for you when you show up and you go to a work party for your husband. You want to, you know, be supportive and get and um, <clears throat> get along with people and 
and you're nervous about what they might think about you. And I think, again, it's really important in those moments to really focus on what's happening, what you're doing, not what you think people are thinking about you, because you just don't know. And a lot of times the things that we think people are thinking about us are really far away from what they are thinking about us. And so in those cases, we want to sort of give ourselves the benefit of the doubt and give other people the benefit of the doubt as well. Anybody else? Let's see, Susan, learning to ask people about themselves at a party, it has helped. I'm so glad you said that. We did talk about that earlier. You know, how do you, uh, you know, sort of teaching the le teaching and learning the rules of conversation. We ask people about themselves. We listen to what they say, and then we reflect back something that we heard, and that lets them feel both that we're interested in them and that they and that we heard what they have to say, and that will often lead to them doing the same thing for us. Um, one of the things that um, we want to be you know careful of is like someone says something and you're like oh I know all about that blah 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 and then that's that can be a little diminishing because it's like oh you were just waiting for your turn to talk about the thing and not really listening to them so thank you Susan for bringing that up I think that's really important um, Georgia says a generation before us didn't know about ADHD and they found compensation I think you did you mean companions I'm not sure um, you know friends are, are how we you know live and breathe you gotta have them um, it, it, you want you don't need a lot you need like maybe a few one to hang out with and somebody if that person's busy um, but we want to have that sense that people know us and they care about us and uh, and um, and they're there for us and that's true for us as adults and it's particularly true for for kids a lot of kids think you know they're not popular they don't have five friends they're social failures and I, I would say absolutely not uh, really kids just need a few friends two maybe three um, at maximum someone they can hang out with when that person's busy someone else to call um, it doesn't have to be a lot of people it's how those people make them feel and how they feel when they're around those people and to remember as parents that our kids might have different needs around friendship than we would like them to have. 